Okay, good afternoon everybody. My name's Nick. Um, as you can probably tell, I have a Y chromosome. So if you're expecting Julia here, unfortunately she's sick and they've asked me to step in at the last minute. So uh, keep calm and stay seated. Now, um, a confession. I'm a total geek. Uh, I'm a data scientist. Uh, one of the things I do is I, I talk about numbers all day long. So this presentation is going to be uh, something a little bit different. I'm going to be talking about uh, the mathematical analysis of games, just for a bit of fun. Um, the first thing is, don't panic. If you've been through uh, high school equivalent math, you're going to be able to sort of uh, keep pace with what I'm going to be saying. And all the slides are going to be available, uh, so don't need to bother making notes. Just listen to what sort of goes on. The last confession as well is this is usually about a two, two and a half hour presentation. I'm going to squash it down to about 20 minutes. So again, I'm going to go very, very fast. The obligatory bio slide. Uh, I've been in the industry about 25 years. I spent uh, 15 years in games. I worked at Microsoft, Casual Games. Uh, I was worked at Real Networks, Analytics. Um, I ran my own consultancy company. And I've just joined Facebook as a data scientist. I've been there about two weeks. So I'll be happy to answer all the questions I can tell you about Facebook that I've managed to learn in about two weeks. So let's start by playing a game. Let's imagine that I, uh, I roll a dice. There's my little dice. If it happens to be a one, two, or three, I'm going to give you a dollar. If it turns out to be a uh, four, five, or six, you give me a dollar. Rhetorical question. Would you play this game? It seems pretty fair. What happens if I change the rules? And rather than a, a one, a three, that uh, if it's a one or a two, I'll give you a dollar. But it's a three, four, five, six, would you play the game? Any takers? Well, no. I don't think anybody will sort of take that game. So, how would you about going decide whether that's a good game or a bad game? And there are two basic mechanisms we can use to decide whether that's a good game or a bad game. The first is experimentation. We can just try the game over and over and over and over and over and over again. And uh, whichever results happen often will, will be the results. Or we can do a formal model where we can mathematically decide, saying, hey, with a one or a two will happen two six of the time, so three, four, five, six, about four six of the time. There's various different advantages and disadvantages of both of those approach. The experimental approach is really easy to write. You just sort of model a game or just run it and script it. You don't really need to understand the mechanics of how the game works. The disadvantage is it takes uh, a long time to run to get sufficient accuracy. And there's a subtle part that um, some very unlikely paths are hard to represent. If you've got a system that one part of the system only happens one in a million times, and then downstream of that some events happen, you've got to run it billions of times in order to uh, uh, exercise those particular tracks. Formal models, uh, you'll get an exact answer straight away, um, but they can be quite complex to understand. And we'll go through a few examples. Sometimes you'll hear them call about objective approaches and subjective approaches. We'll not talk about that. And the last concept that we need to understand about this is the concept of an expected outcome. When I uh, roll my dice, uh, what is the expected outcome I'm going to get? And with a formal model, we can uh, accurately work it out straight away. There's one six chance of a one, one six chance of a two all the way through. So we'll get a, uh, an exact answer straight away. If we want to do a, uh, an experimentation model, we're going to run it thousands and thousands of times, and gradually we'll get to the right result. Now, a, a, a crazy example. Let's say uh, I roll three dice. And don't worry about the rules. They're just some sort of arbitrary rules. But I'm saying, if the three number are odd numbers, I'm going to re-roll the two lowest one. If there are two odd numbers, I'll re-roll the lowest one. And then it will sum them all up if it's odd, even, blah, 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 blah. So if the total is greater than 17, I'll give you $7. If it's not, we'll give you $3. So the question is now, would you play this game? I have no idea. How would you decide whether that's a good idea or not? And if we try to do a subjective model, first of all, we'll roll one dice, and then sort of two and three. And very quickly, it gets very, 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 very complicated. And we could do it that way. But the uh, other way is to do a sort of Monte Carlo simulation, where what we'll do is we'll try playing the game. We'll play it again and again and again and again and look at the results. And yes, it's named after the casino. So here's an example of uh, the plot by playing the game a billion times. And this is the result where we said that uh, 17 here, this happens 76% of the time. Here, this happens 23% of the time. We lose $3 here. We gain $7 there. So overall, we're losing about uh, 66 cents a game. So should we play the game? The answer is probably not. OK, that's all the basics out of the way. Now let's move on to some real world examples. Snakes and ladders, or shoots and ladders, I'm sure. Uh, whoever sort of played this game. If you have kids, I'm sure you've played this particular game. Question, yeah, how long does a game of shoots and ladders actually last? And here's a, a model of a board, and you can see these, oh, um, I pushed the wrong button. Here are ladders, and here are the snakes. And the shortest way to sort of play the game, um, by chance, happens to be you can uh, roll a four, and then a six, and then a six. And this is how the sort of game is played. And actually, after uh, six moves, it's possible to win the game. But how long does an average game sort of take? 
And we can model it in different ways. And one of the ways we can do is this Monte Carlo simulation. We'll say, hey, let's play the game, and play it again, and again, and again, and again. And we get this particular curve, which tells you uh, the number of rolls, what the percentage chance of the game finishing in that time. And I played a billion games, and we worked out uh, the modal number of moves is 20. The most likely number of moves a game of uh, shoots and ladders will take is 20. Here is a uh, cumulative probability where we stack them all up, saying, what is the percentage chance of finishing the game in that number of moves or less? And you can sort of see that mercifully, 97.6% uh, of the games take 100 moves or less. And if we wanted to work out the median number, that's 29, where as many games take longer than 29 moves as less. So again, um, you know, for, for the mathematicians there, what kind of average are you looking for? The modal, what's the most number of likely number of moves? The median, how many games take more and take less? And then the arithmetic mean, which we, we talk about after 36 billion games, it took me 36.2 billion rolls to sort of get those things sorted out. A smarter way to do it um, is uh, using a subjective approach called Markov chains. There's a, a very famous Russian mathematician, Andrei Andreevich Markov. Uh, he invented this sort of uh, principle 100 years ago this year. And pretty much everything, every financial model you've ever heard about, every weather model, all those things, goes back to the concept of a Markov chain. And what he does is, as you can say, you can model anything in life to a, a series of states, and all you have to do is work out what the probability is you can move between those particular states. So if I'm in this state one, it's raining today, or whatever, I, or what place I'm being, I could either be going to state two, state three, or state four. And what you have to do to build up a Markov model of this particular thing is um, work out what the probabilities are that you go from either of those states or stay in the same state yourself. There's uh, some fancy words. Uh, we call it a, a stochastic process. Um, the, the concept, the critical to uh, Markov chain analysis is it's a memoryless system. Um, so if I might happen to be on square G of my board, uh, on the next roll I could end up at G1 plus 1, G plus 2, G plus 3, all the way. So there's, something's going to happen and I'm going to end up at these particular spaces. Um, it doesn't matter how we got to square G, we could have been there forever or we could have come backwards or come forwards. This memoryless system is the idea of once you're on square G, what are the chances you're going to be at each of these uh, squares at the sub point? And the other thing, and they call it stochastic, it means all the probabilities must add up to one. Something's going to have to happen. On the next roll from square G, you're going to go somewhere. So to do a Markov chain analysis, you create a matrix, and they call it a, it's a transition matrix that says, hey, whatever state you happen to be in, there's a chance you're going to go to another particular state, and you give it a probability. Uh, and it's a square matrix that just gives you a series of the probabilities of moving from one state to another. So here's an example for our uh, shoots and ladders. Let's say we're on square 11. There's a 1 6 chance you're going to be on square 12, 1 6 square 12, 13. And so you create this uh, sparse matrix, pretty much for the leading diagonal. That's assuming you have a board with no other shoots and ladders on the board. Then we start to add some snakes or ladders uh, to the board, and it changes the transition matrix. So here, if we imagine we're on square 18, there is a 1 6 chance you're going to be on square 19. So square 18, there's a 1 6 chance we get to square 19. 1 6 chance we get to square 20. Uh oh, we land on the snake, and that takes us back to here. So we don't have the 6 here, it goes to here. And then 12, 21, and then from here, 23, we don't have a space in 23 because we end up at 28. So now we modify the probabilities. But again, for stochasticness, everything on that row adds up to 1. When we're on square 18, something happens when we go from square 18. A couple of things we have to watch out for. Some of the squares you can get to more than one way. Um, for an example, from here, we're on square 50. You can get to square 54 in two ways. You can roll a, a natural 4, 1, 2, 3, 4. Or you can actually roll a 6 and go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and get the snake and go back there. So there's a 2, 6 probability that you're going to end up in square 53 um, rather than uh, a 1, 6. Um, last thing to watch out for, you don't need an exact roll to finish, certainly in the rules that we play in our house. So if you start at square 97, there's a, actually a 4, 6 chance that you can actually get to square 100 from there. Once we have all those probabilities put in our transition matrix, we, we build this large uh, square matrix of all the possible states we're in and all the possible states we can go to. We put in the starting state, and everybody uh, in shoots and ladders starts off the board of this state zero that's off the board. And then we multiply it by the matrix, and we get the ending states. So uh, let's try it out. Here's our board, and we start off at square zero off the board, and we roll the dice. And here's what we happen, and this is a, 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 like a probability density function. It tells you what, what's the probability going to be these individual squares. And you see there are six possible places we could be. We can't end up in square one because we land up on the ladder, we go to here. Square two, three, again, square four, we end up in going up to here. So this is where we are at the end of one roll. This is that there's a one six chance we'll be in all these squares, and a zero percent chance we'll be in any of the other squares. But this is the beauty about where Markov chains come in it's wash, rinse, repeat. We take those starting states out of the way, we now take the ending states. 
And we feed them back into our game and say, okay, now where would we be if we started from all of those and create the superposition of all those particular states? We multiply them out, do our matrix manipulation, and we get our new ending states. So here's our new starting state, roll one. Where would we on roll two? And you can see, again, the cloud. There is a more likely chance we're around, around here. From one here, there's a one-sixth chance we'll go for all these other squares. So it's the superposition starting at all the places we are. What is the chance that we start, if we start at all those with a certain probability elsewhere? And then we wash, rinse, repeat. Where would we be after roll three? Oh, can we see? My, my clicker stopped working. Everything stopped working. The whole laptop has crashed. Not good. Control Alt. No, it's not responding to a single click. Okay. That seems to work. <laughs> right way down. He's lots of clicks. <laughs> There we go. Okay, we're back to roll three. No, I think it's hung again. When in doubt, bring out this another laptop. I have it all. Um Try plugging this in. Yeah. 
Trinkst du? Okay. Slight technical problems. So here we have uh, roll three, roll four, five, six, and you can see the probability cloud moving over. When we get to roll seven, there is a non-zero chance that we can actually get to the end and uh, you can actually finish the game. Roll eight. By the time we get to roll uh, 20 or 100, there's a chance that the, 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 the chance that we're on the final square is very high. Here is a, uh, an animation. You can sort of see as the rolls move on, the probability cloud sort of moves further and further and further afield. Comparing uh, the objective and the subjective model, model together, we've got a form model and experimentation model. We can put them all together. And you can see that they uh, match within the ideas of experimental error. And the difference between these lines is just the uh, randomness of the probability uh, random number generator that goes through. A couple of trivia takeaways. Once we have our uh, model for modeling the shoots and ladders board, we can actually play around with moving some of the, uh, the ladders and the snakes further around. Um, you find out that uh, ladder number one is used only if you happen to roll a one to start off with, which happens one sixth of the time. And you can actually decrease the length of the game by adding um, snakes, which seems a little bit of in intuitive, but um, these long ladders are very important to the game. So if you add an extra snake that takes you sort of back through, if you miss the ladder the first time, you land on a snake, it gives you a second chance to use that ladder, which is a very important way to sort of finish the game in a short period of time. Candyland, I don't know whether any of you uh, play Candyland with your kids. It's another game where you don't really have any sort of choice of the moves. So it's a perfect mod game that can be modeled with a Markov chain. But um, uh-oh, it's not a memoryless system. When you have a stack of cards and you draw the cards, the concentration of the cards changes because as you take cards out of the deck, they're no longer there. And so it's not a memoryless system because the probability that you're going to move on to the next move is dependent on things that have happened in the past. But what we can do is approximate this. We call it a, a sort of a, a crippled Markov chain that says, well, okay, why don't I draw a card from here, act on it, put it back in the deck and shuffle the deck again, then draw another card out again. So there's a chance that I'll draw the same card twice, but it's uh, a little bit um, unlikely. We model the Markov chain in the same sort of way. And again, we can see as we move through the probability cloud, I think of an animation that sort of talks, walks you through um, the animation of the, uh, uh, of the game. This now sort of compare, there is a subtle difference now between a Monte Carlo simulation and uh, the Cripple Markov chain. This is because, again, we're going to be using some of the cards. And there's the inflection sort of point about here. By the time you've gone through 64 cards, you'll have chosen every single card in the deck. So you will have actually been a chance to expose to some of those cards. And again, Candyland changes depending on the number of players. When you have lots of players in the game, everybody draws a card. So you're going to go through the deck very, very quickly. And they are just the probability that people are going to win. Next example, uh, Texas Hold'em Poker. I don't know how many people here play poker. Yeah, but uh, you're sitting there with your cards, and you think, well, what is the best starting hand? Um, because it's interesting with sort of poker. The odds are very interesting. Um, some hands in poker are very important to have the cards of the same suit for flushes, somewhere they're the same card, and sometimes where they're numerically connected together. And if you're going for one thing, there's a chance you're going to win. If you're going for another thing, it's a different set of probabilities that have go through. And um, with just two players of the game, you know, there are billions of combinations. By the time you get to sort of 10 players of the game, the, the, the number of combinations is immense. And the subtle part about uh, playing sort of poker is that the odds change depending on the number of the people are in the game. If there's just two people playing the game head to head and there's a gut shot or a partial straight on the table, the chances that somebody will have the card to complete the straight is quite low. When there are 10 people at the table, somebody's bound to have the card that's going to complete the straight. So the average hand required to win increases. Uh, here's an example uh, of playing sort of poker with uh, two players, and then we'll look at sort of 10 players later on. There are 169 possible starting hands for poker. Uh, we've got pocket aces, kings, queens, all the way down to sort of pocket twos. The ones on the upper triangle here with the S, they mean suited. The ones on the lower triangle are unsuited. When you're playing with two players, um, it really doesn't matter whether you have suited cards or not. It's based on uh, the chances of you could be winning without them being suited is very unimportant. And there's a lot of symmetry. And again, um, having an ace at any point seems to be a sort of really good hand. By the time you uh, get to 10 players, the odds have changed sort of quite a lot. Things have moved, shifted that are much further into the suited things. If you don't have painted cards, if you don't have cards that could possibly make a flush or a straight flush, then you're much further uh, away from a chance to win. Even things like jack seven suited, seven, eight, nine, 10 jack, they're loosely connected, you could possibly make a straight. So again, that uh, throws the odds in your favor. Risk, uh, another dice game that sort of uh, comes along. Here in the game of Risk, uh, the attacker rolls up to three dice, the defender rolls up to two dice. 
Here, sometimes, instead of going through things, brute force is easy, trying to work out all this huge probability tree. At the end of the day, there are only uh, 7,776 combinations. So why not just sort of work through all the combinations and work out who's going to win and who's not going to win? And again, you end up with these results that says, well, if you've got three attacking versus and two defending, what's the chance the attacker's going to win two, defender wins two, and you have all these probability uh, matrices that sort of come along. But of course, playing risk, you have more than just head-to-head. Uh, -head. So sometimes you have an uh, attack with seven and five. And what you end up doing is you build up a tree that sort of says, what is the chance that the uh, defender's going to lose two? What are the attacks that everybody loses one each? Or oh, these people lose two. And going back to this particular thing, we can fill in those probabilities for each of those things. And then we iterate all the way through and recurse all the way through until we get the answers. This is mouse type. You're not really expected to see it. But then we can actually shade the probabilities and says uh, a picture paints a thousand numbers. Here is a shaded red where the attacker has the advantage. It's shaded blue where it has the defender has advantage. And uh, I think it's better to attack than defend. There's always superior numbers. And if you're attacking a region, you need to make sure that you have uh, at least five armies. There's some results that come through. If you're developing a social game, why is this important? A lot of people who develop social games, they'll put little meta mini games inside their social gaming experience where they have a little casino where you can take your in-game currency and go to a casino. If you get things wrong, money flows into, the, into your economy, which is very bad. Why is this very bad? Um, your character in the game wants to buy a shield, and it's 10 gold pieces of your in-game currency. But rather than spending uh, 10 gold pieces, he goes to the local casino, and then money grows on trees because you've got the balance of the game wrong. And so you get rampant inflation because now the value of what 10 gold pieces used to be. This player is going to be very pissed off if he had to spend real more money to buy 10 gold pieces, then somebody else could go into the casino and, uh, and make all this money. So you have to stop rampant inflation in, uh, in social games. And again, we don't have a lot of time to talk about it, but it's managing the sources and sinks. Every time that money comes in the game, you want to be able to destroy the money in the game to keep the amount of uh, money in the economy fixed. It's kind of easy to do in some ways, but on a social game, you don't necessarily control the number of players who are going to be coming into the game, and usually people start with pocket money. So if you've got lots of people coming into the game, or with some free pocket money you've given them, all of a sudden the amount of money in the game changes, and you have to balance it by sinking it out in the right way. Uh, Last example, I th um, uh, to sort of go through Yahtzee. Um, this is something that uh, a lot of the people on the, in, on the internet sort of get wrong. You know, what's the chance of getting a probability of a Yahtzee? On the first roll, it's very easy, but uh, of course, you have more than one roll. Uh, and here we can create, a, again, a Markov chain. If you have five of a kind, you can end up with five of a kind straight away. If you've got four of a kind, there's a five, six chance you're still going to end up with four of a kind at the end of the day, but there's a one, six chance you'll, you'll, you'll get the number, and then you can work through things. This is the thing where sort of uh, people get the probability wrong, and this is the idea, if you roll the five dice and you've got a pair, you're going to hold the pair off to one side, and then you re-roll the three dice. When you re-roll the three dice, the chances are those three may end up matching, in which case you're going to dump the two you've kept and, and hold the three. So the chances of going from here to here, you also have to take into account that you could actually get three of a kind from the other and, and, and switch them through. Uh, 4.6%. Uh, in my house, they always say, Daddy, can we have one more roll? So again, what's the chance of, uh, of getting the uh, Yahtzee if you have one more roll? And again, I don't have time to talk about uh, what the chances are. You end up at all the different states in between. Very last example, and then I think we're out of time. Uh, darts. I don't know how many people play darts, but a question. Where's the best place to aim on a dartboard to maximize the score? And the answer is really, it depends on uh, how good a player you are. If you're a really good player, you should aim for the triple 20 because it's the highest score on the uh, board. But if you miss, you end up in the five or the one. Maybe there's somewhere on the board that's a better place to aim, but if you miss, you'll still get a reasonable score rather than a very poor score. So again, we can sort of model this in different ways. Um, and, and this is kind of an example. If you're a really good player, then yes, you should aim there. But as your skill decreases, your, the standard deviation of, of, of what you're likely to get sort of uh, increases, it's uh, much more likely you're going to get into sort of poorer scoring areas. And maybe, for instance, it's better to sort of aim somewhere over here. We can model this mathematically by sort of saying, hey, there's a chance it's a standard deviation, there's a circular normal distribution of how you can aim for a certain spot and you're going to hit some of these other particular areas somewhere in between. And we can create some heat maps. This tells you uh, where to aim. This is a standard deviation of, uh, of 17 millimeters. I don't know whether this is actually going to work, but I, I tried to create an, an, an animation um, showing how, as your error increases, and yes, if you're a really good player, you should be aiming for the 20, but after a little while, as your ac accuracy decreases, then you should be aiming towards a sort of triple 19, and gradually we'll sort of see this migrate around. Ultimately, you should aim, um, if you're a really good player, you should aim at triple 20. If you're a mediocre player, you should be aiming over here. If you're a really bad player, 
you should be aiming at the bullseye because even hitting the board is, is you're going to get it some score at all. So the aiming straight at the bullseye is, uh, is, is, a, is the right strategy for you to do. And you can see how there's a path here showing the, the migration of the, uh, the uh, optimal aiming reticle as we go increase. You can do interesting pictures that can show you know, where is the probability that you should be sort of aiming based on, on, on those things. Darts is one of the games. There's actually an interesting skill elbow. This is the uh, standard deviation of what your error happens to be, and this is the expected score. There's a skill elbow here. What, this is interesting because there's a sharp curve. It sort of says that if you're going to play against a dart player who's really good here, they're going to wipe the floor with you. So there's a certain point where if you cannot get well on this particular certain accuracy of darts, so there's really sort of no point in playing darts. And this actually sort of shows you, again, this is the point where uh, it tips off and asymptotes to, to, to zero with the arrow. This is where you're starting to miss the board and not getting very many scores at all. Um, if you can like these examples, uh, as a hobby, what I actually do is do a lot of uh, mathematic analysis of games. And I actually write a blog here. Here are some very different sort of screenshots. I go through classic card and board games, uh, battleships, and other pieces from there. And with that, I think we've uh, come to the end. And I uh, finished and run out of time. There may be a couple of minutes for sort of questions. And if not, then I will uh, let you free for uh, the next speaker. Thank you very much. Oh, we have a question. Do you have a mic? One moment, please. No, we, we need the microphone, I'm afraid, for, for the video. Um, you've given us examples of board games and, of course, like making the transition to casual, um, not casual, to social games, mm -hmm. like is it's oh, turn-based games, I would say it makes lots of sense. Uh, what's, in your personal experience, what's the most, how do you say, um, most uh, action or hardcore-based games where you have tried to apply a mathematical model, basically? I mean, you can slump, it's the question of defining the states, right? Even if it looks like an action game, you can still define the states reaching the next level or whatever. What's, what's the... the and the, the, most, the, the game that you've worked on, which we wouldn't expect a way you've applied this, actually? It, it, it's a loaded question, because it really depends on what the, the goal happens to be. I've been in the, the industry for a long time, and uh, the very early games that we used to develop were all standalone games, where you'd sort of play a game, and the other person you were playing against was yourself. So if you're playing a solitaire game, and a basic solitaire game, there's, you know, there's a 1 in 13 chance that you'll complete the game. And so 12 times out of 13, you feel bad because you don't complete the game. If you can modify the odds so that you can peek at a card or you can change the odds, you feel good. Or if you're playing a casino and you're the only person who's, who's playing the casino, then tipping the odds in the favor of you doesn't matter. It makes that person feel good. And so you can, you can do good things there. As soon as you're playing in a space where it needs to be fair, zero-sum game for everybody, then you want to sort of uh, make sure that the, the rules are fair. And I, I would say... Um, Tweaking the rules to make somebody have a really fun experience when they're playing by themselves was, was, was the thing to sort of balance and sort of get right, to make it, it's not too easy, not too hard. And then understanding that when the, you're playing in, a, in an environment with lots of other people, making sure that the rules are very fair and transparent is the best answer I can give. Okay, I, I think we, we have and five minutes you? break before the next presentation. Thank you. And we'll, we'll try and fix the laptop. <laughs>